Hello dear students, so in continuation to our discussions on atmospheric thermodynamics, we have seen what is equivalent potential temperature in the last class. Today we will continue our uh, discussions on parcel lapse rates. So let us consider an air parcel, so, so far so we have considered an air parcel and this air parcel is at the same pressure as the surroundings and the temperature can be anything, I mean temperature can be a temperature, the change in the temperature will only decide whether the air parcel is going to rise or sink. So, the, the, let us consider the parcel of dry air at a temperature T prime. So, the temperature inside is considered to be T prime, the parcel moves in an environment with a, lab, with a temperature T. So, the temperature outside is taken to be T. So, we have defined the potential temperature to be that particular temperature which an air parcel will eventually reach if it is compressed or expanded to reach the uh, sea surface or the standard pressure, right. So, we can define the, uh, the potential temperature with respect to the temperature of the air parcel T prime as this. So, theta is equal to T prime times P naught by P rise to the power R by C P, right. So, we can take a logarithm of theta. Then, uh, differentiating with resp differentiating this expression with respect to z with respect to the height so we are trying to find out how the temperature of the air parcel changes let's say how it changes as the air parcel rises or sinks in comparison to the in putting the uh, standard pressure p naught with reference and let us see how the temperature varies with respect to height and how it connects or how it relates to the dry adiabatic lapse rate or moist adiabatic lapse rate, right. So, we have taken a de derivative of theta uh, ln theta which will be take a logarithmic derivative of this expression. So, it will be 1 by theta d theta by dz is equals to ln t prime is 1 by t prime d t prime by dz. So, this is the lapse rate that I am talking about. So, this lapse rate tells you how the temperature changes inside the air parcel subject to the conditions that the air parcel is adiabatic in nature with our assumptions and there is no exchange of heat. At the same time, it is just the same pressure with respect to the surroundings. So, this derivative will give you R by C p, uh, this p naught being a constant, this term will be 0 and minus ln p will be 1 by p d p by d z. So, the derivative is with respect to the height. So, for ambient air, so that means with respect to the temperature capital T, the temperature the hydrostatic equilibrium can be simply d p by d z is equals to minus rho g. So, what does it? It tells you how the pressure of the ambience changes with respect to height and how it relates to the gravity, right. Now, if we, we can use this, this term into this part. Right. So, we can combine these two equations 1 by theta d, so the same expression. So, here we have, we have used this we have combined these two expressions. What we will get is 1 by theta d theta by dz is equals to 1 by t prime d t prime by dz minus r by c p into 1 by p times minus g rho. Right. So, for adiabatic process we have when we discussed the potential temperature we talking about the invariance of few physical quantity. Generally, uh, in an adiabatic process d q is 0 that means heat taken or heat given out is 0 and this will make sure that the potential temperature will remain a constant if the process is adiabatic. That means, if you rise a parcel from one point say let us say level 1 to level 2 let us say. Now, here the most importantly the, sur the pressure at the surface or the reference pressure is P naught. Now, according to the definition of potential temperature, we can say that if the temperature inside is T, 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 T prime. Okay. Now, if you bring this air parcel, air parcel's pressure to this P naught, then whatever the temperature T prime that become, that will become T prime to T let us say T 1 or T 2 let us say this T 2 is called as the potential temperature, right. Or you can also say that let us say now let us say this is uh, T 1 prime, the temperature at the level 2 is T 1 prime let us say. Even if you bring this air parcels pressure to the surface pressure which is P naught, this temperature will also be theta. That means, as long as there is no heat 
input or output from this air parcel, the potential temperature will remain a constant. That is the basic idea. So, uh, a process which keeps the potential temperature constant is called as the adiabatic process. Right. So, in this in this equation, we can take it for uh, for granted that when we are talking about parcel lapse rates, that how temperature changes with respect to height, it will be guaranteed that within the parcel, the potential temperature will always be kept constant. Not temperature, but the potential temperature will be kept constant. So, this term straight forward becomes 0. Right. So, what you have left with is 1 by T prime d t prime by d z. So, d t prime by d z is what we want to find out. We want to find out, we want to understand how temperature changes inside the air parcel. But why is the temperature should change the inside the air parcel? That is the, that's the question. For, for, for starters, what we can see is if the air parcel is rising for some reason, whatever the stability that permits this rise, if the air parcel is rising, in order to keep itself at the same pressure as the ambience, the parcel must expand. So, when this expansion happens, this expansion has to be at the expense of the internal energy of the air parcel. So, if the internal energy is taken out automatically, the temperature will decrease. So, this is one reason why temperature should decrease in the first place for an air parcel which is assumed to be adiabatic. Right. Now, we are, we are trying to find out how this expression looks like. So, we have simply substituted this into this. So, d t prime by d z is the rate of change of temperature inside the air parcel with respect to height. So, this becomes now 0. So, d t prime by d z can simply be written as r rho t prime. So, this is just rearranging this, this term r rho t prime into g divided by p c p. Right. That is what we have written carried forward here. So, from the ideal gas law, so pressure p is r times density times temperature substituting this into into this part. So, d t prime by d z is equal to t prime by t into g by c p right. Now, we know that this part g by c p minus g by c p is called as the dry adiabatic lapse rate we have written here already. So, this, this part uh, so, d t prime so, to be more precise d t prime by d t is t prime by t times gamma d. That means, temperature the, ra the rate at which temperature changes inside the air parcel is of course, dependent on the dry adiabatic lapse rate, but also on the ratio of temperatures between the air parcel and the surroundings. Let us say the atmosphere is stable with respect to the parcel. That, that means, the parcels convec convective movements are not allowed. In that case, the temperature inside the air parcel is also equal to the temperature outside the air parcel. So, the entire stability uh, derivations that we have seen are basically built up on this concept that temperature changes are the ones which will allow the air parcel to rise or sink. Right. So, we can say that the rate at which the temperature changes inside the air parcel is simply equal to the dry adiabatic lapse rate multiplied by the ratio of the temperatures. Right. Now, so we have seen what is the stability, what, what kind of stability uh, allows an air parcel to rise and why the air is, why the, why the rise of the air parcel is important is, it, it is important to understand the concept of condensation, it is important to understand the idea of formation of the clouds, various different types of the clouds and so many things. right? So, atmospheric stability we have seen in detail how we can calculate the frequency of the oscillations which are permitted by the stable atmosphere and when the atmosphere can be called as neutral, when the atmosphere can be called as conditionally stable, when the atmosphere can be called as absolutely stable or absolutely unstable. So, having discussed all these things, it is now appropriate for us to go ahead and discuss the uh, the processes of precipitation and rains. So, we will cover a lot of uh, discussion on the clouds, how the clouds are formed, how many different types of clouds exist, uh, all these things, but after that we will, we, will, uh, we will have to understand what is the process of precipitation and how does rain form. So, now, so far in our understanding whatever uh, the convective processes or any other process which could lift the air 
to a particular height which is called as the lifting condensation level will be responsible for the creation of clouds. Okay. So, today we will touch upon the basics of something like that and then we will see how we can uh, mathematically understand the precipitation process and what kind of uh, effects are important to decide the rate of precipitation and things like that. Right. So, so let us say if you just look at uh, the various different types of clouds, you will always notice that there are some clouds which will be vertically developed that means they will their vertical extent the top of the cloud is at a very great height and you will always see that some many of the many times like 90 percent of the times you will you will see that clouds are not vertically developed rather they are suspended in a let us say at uh, 8 to 10 kilometers altitude with no much vertical development right and it is also to be noticed that whenever you have large accumulation of vertically developed clouds which are also called as the cumulonimbus clouds, the chances of rain or any other natural uh, precipitation process are very likely. Right. So, what are, the, what are the primary means of convection? So, the convection can uh, convection uh, let us say the, the by, by the means of convection I am just uh, uh, trying to understand how a bubble can travel from the surface towards the higher altitudes because it is its movement is against the gravity. So, we by all means we always take it for granted that the atmosphere is in hydrostatic equilibrium which means the, the vertical pressure gradient force is always balanced by the gravitational pull. So, as long as this balance is held the parcel or the any bubble should not rise into the sky right. So, there, there are four different ways in which this can be achieved one is surface heating surface gets heated up the air near the surface is low it becomes low in density. So, it, it has it, it naturally has a tendency to rise right. So, topo topographic lifting is when the uh, when the air encounters a land mass which is which, which has which is which is building up on an elevation. So, the air will travel across the elevation and it will reach the higher altitudes allowing condensation to happen. Convergence at the surface is when air when air directed in different directions converge to a point and this convergence makes a situation uh, in which air can only rise upwards, but in, in not in any other direction will be called as convergence uh, at the surface or front force lifting or frontal lifting is also a mechanism in which two different fronts of let us say the cold air mass which is less likely to occupy the lower altitudes or near the surface if warm air which travels from some other parts or geographically some other regions travels towards this cold surface then it is naturally this cold surface will make the uplift of the warm air resulting in the in the vertical movement of the air right. So, this is the convection this, this convection is very simple. So, because of the heating of the surface air will rise right. Now, here it is you always remember the vertical development of the cloud is subject only to the stability of the atmosphere. That means, how the dry adiabatic lapse rate compares with respect to the environment lapse rate. So, this is the relation between these two lapse rates will only decide how the air will rise. So, this is the topographic lifting when the air is traveling like this. So, it, it has to travel across this topography. So, it will naturally rise somewhere at this point if your LCL is existing then it will lead to the formation of clouds that is it right. And this is the convergence of air. So, air is converging into this low pressure region. So, it is naturally a low pressure region if there is high pressure. So, air is bound to travel like this and if it is such that air is traveling from all directions into this low pressure region air cannot go anywhere I mean so it has to, so air can never go from a low pressure to high pressure system. So, this this is forbidden. So, the air has an, has a natural way of rising towards the higher altitudes and forming the clouds and lifting along the weather front. So, cold air like I said cold air is will occupy the lower altitudes if warm air comes from some other region. So, this cold air will will create the lift for this warm air to rise to higher altitudes ok. So, so topography and let us say topography is, is more important in the sense it, it creates more uh, amount of let us say cloud cover. 
orographic lifting, forcible lifting along the topographic barrier mountains. It also creates a rain shadow, the region on the leeward side of the mountain where precipitation is noticeably low and the air is often drier. Okay. Lenticular uh, clouds are the ones which mountain wave clouds from the lee side of the mountains, they also resemble that form in a river downside, downstream from a larger boulder. So, this is various, various effects of uh, the topographic clouds. Okay, so, if you see this example, you will realize that the, uh, the dew point temperature for these conditions is 12 degrees Celsius. So, 12 degrees, so the, uh, at the surface, the temperature is 12, 20 degrees Celsius. If it rises, when it reaches that particular uh, minus 12 degrees Celsius, when the, when the temperature reaches this, automatically at the dew point condensation is bound to happen and it will be it will be the formation of clouds. So, now further uplift will, will only result in the formation of rain and what will happen is this is the windward side from which the wind is coming and the leeward side is the other side. So, automatically when it, when it tries to sink, the, this is the main, uh, main aspect that you must have learnt already in your earlier classes is that on the side, on the leeward side, the way air is warmed, I mean it has to travel down and in the process it will get warmer and generally this place will be devoid of any rain. Okay. Now, so the air stability is what influences the, uh, the formation of rain or formation of, uh, so this, these aspects we have already covered, right. So now once the, once the condensation happens inside the cloud, so, so we have to understand the process between let us say so the vapor condenses to form the cloud droplets. The cloud droplets are very small in size and the, if the cloud droplets grow to a substantial size where gravity can start acting on them, then they are going to be called as the rain droplets and once the rain droplets are developed inside the cloud, the cloud becomes unstable and this will result into the precipitation. this will result in the precipitation. So, in the clouds with, with which, which are whose tops are warmer than minus 15 degrees Celsius, collisions between the droplets, collisions between the cloud droplets, I am saying small droplets they will come along, they will, they will collide between droplets can play a significant role in producing precipitation. So, the processes by which cloud droplets can grow into rain droplets are two which are collision is one process and coalescence is another process which is, which is which kind of combines the effects of collision. So, large drops from uh, form on large condensation nuclei or through random collisions of droplets. So, we have already seen what are condensation nuclei, uh, these are the nuclei over which, over which uh, condensation or let us say condensation will happen. So, these droplets are attractive in nature for the water molecules, right. So, as the droplets fall, when they are falling inside the cloud, larger droplets fall faster of course naturally than the smaller droplets. So, the larger droplets overtake and collide with smaller droplets in this process or in their path. So, the merging of let us say these tiny cloud droplets by collision is generally called as the coalescence. So, so we have to note that the collision does not always guarantee co coalescence. I mean coalescence is a process in which a droplet of a given size becomes even larger in its path by combining or by uh, making the merger of smaller droplets happen within itself, to itself, right. So, typically if you look at the sizes, a size comparison of these, uh, where it is different. Uh, so, we are talking about the condensation nuclei, we are talking about rain droplet, we are talking about the cloud droplet, right. So, the condensation nuclei is, is very small, it is of the order of micrometers. So, here what is given is the condensation nuclei is typically of the order of 0 0.2 or 0 0.9 micrometers. So, this is the cloud droplet, this cloud droplet is the one which forms when condensation happens, this, 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 is, the, this is the cloud. So, a collection of these tiny droplets is what you call as the cloud, you always remember that. Okay. When this droplet grows to this size of 200 micrometers, then you call it as a rain droplet. So, the process from here to here is basically the collision and coalescence, right. 
So, just for, uh, for, for remembering this, you always remember the cloud condensation nuclei are the smallest in diameter and the typical rain uh, cloud droplet is of the order of 20 micrometers. These droplets will collide, they will combine to form bigger droplets. Once the bigger droplet has formed, it will fall and it will create precipitation. And this rain droplet is, is typically of the order of 200, 2000 micrometers. Right. So, let us say how does it happen, how does this action happen and what kind of physical effects will come into picture when this is happening. So, what can uh, probably aid the formation of rain droplets and what can hamper the rate at which the rain droplets are formed, right, these kind of things that we are going to learn. So, in a warm cloud uh, composed only of let us say small cloud droplets of uniform size, the droplets are, very, are less likely to collide as they fall very slowly at about the same speed, right. So, those droplets that do collide frequently do not coalesce because of the strong surface tension that holds together the each tiny droplets, right. So, if, if the let us say small cloud droplets, so generally the falling will be smaller and also the surface tension of each droplet, each spherical uh, droplet will not permit more water to condense into it and thereby growing in size. So, in a let us say in a cloud composed of different size droplets. So, earlier we have seen a cloud which is made up of tiny droplets, all of them are very tiny where you have less chance of uh, developing precipitation. But if you consider a cloud which is composed of different size droplets, let us say, larger droplets fall faster than the smaller droplets naturally, right. And although some tiny droplets are swept aside, some collect on the larger droplets, while others captured in the wake of the larger droplets coalesce on the droplets backside. Right. So, this is what I mean to say, this is, so some droplets may actually bounce back, they won't, they may not coalesce into this. You see this, this one like these are the droplets which are, which are collected and these droplets which, which fall from the side of the wake, right. So, so this droplet when it collects all these tiny droplets, this will grow bigger in size and then it probably may reach the size of the rain droplet and you will eventually see precipitation. What, so, what are warm cloud? What happens in the warm cloud? A cloud droplet rising and rising then falling through a warm cumulus cloud can grow by collision and coalescence and emerge from the cloud as a large rain droplet. Due to the turbulent processes, if this droplet rises, uh, so this will some, some point it will reach a cloud droplet size, then it will, if when it reaches the rain droplet size, it will fall and it will create precipitation. So, the factors that factors that depend or that decide uh, the cloud formation and rain droplet production, let us say. What are the what are the various factors which influence the rates at which cloud droplets or these are done. So, the clouds liquid water content is ultimately the primary factor which will decide the cloud formation rate. Rain, the range of droplet sizes, what what sizes do you have the droplets in, let us say. The cloud thickness, what is the what is the vertical development of the cloud, how thick is the cloud. Heaviest precipitation generally occurs in those clouds with most vertical development like we said already, right. And the updrafts of the cloud, how uh, how the cloud is supporting vertical movement inside the cloud or how the uh, wind shear or how the turbulence is, is happening. So, the electric charge on the droplets and the electric field in the cloud. So, these factors will influence the cloud formation and rain droplet formation. So, so first you have to realize the formation of cloud, then inside as the stability or let us say when the cloud becomes unstable, it will it will eventually be rain, right. So, there are other processes in which we generally see clouds depending on their height of occurrence need not always contain only uh, water that means droplets, they, are, they sometimes also contain the ice crystals, ice crystals or let us say if the, if the cloud is at very high altitude generally they also contain ice. So, processes of rain formation proposes that both ice crystals and liquid cloud droplets must coexist in the clouds at temperatures below freezing, okay. So, this process is extremely important to rain formation in the middle and high latitudes where cloud drops 
cloud tops extend over the freezing level. So it's natural. I mean, if you if you put your cloud at let's say freezing temperatures or sub freezing temperatures, you won't get uh, droplets. Rather, you will get ice crystals, right? So these processes are called as Bergeron Bergeron processes. Okay. So so let's say for for example, uh, we take the uh, cumulonimbus cloud, which is by far the most magnificent type of cloud that we can see. So the cumulonimbus cloud uh, supports various phases of water. That means water, vapor, and ice. Let's say. So in the bottom most places of the cumulonimbus cloud, you will find only liquid water, nothing else. That means let's say up to the height of let's say uh, three thousand feet or one thousand meters. So somewhere in between. So this the bottom most uh, part of the cumulonimbus cloud supports liquid water only and this is where all the collision and coalescence occur i mean collision of the droplets subsequently they are coming together and becoming a bigger droplet and things like that right so when you go up so this is the freezing level 0 degree celsius is the freezing level so that means that means water cannot exist in its liquid form above this temperature so in this in this middle part of the cumulonimbus cloud you see only you see mixed water and ice and this temperatures could be as low as minus 20 degree Celsius. So, you see little amount of water in the liquid form and also ice. When you go to the I mean topmost part of the cumulonimbus cloud, it is basically it is only ice. So, it is glaciated I mean it is it is not it is not that it is a very hard ice. So these are uh, ice crystals tiny ice crystals which are which are formed I mean, which are formed out of out of a di slightly different uh, physical process right. So, this is how various different uh, phases of uh, water, let us say ice crystals or water or mixed phase between the ice and water and only water can exist, can coexist in a hugely on in a developed or vertically developed cumulonimbus cloud. So, we will stop here. So, we will continue the discussion on the formation of ice crystals or snowflakes and how we can uh, mathematically understand how the rates of these processes can be controlled or how this uh, how we can decide the average rate of precipitation in a given situation okay